acceptable affairs. And what is, <laughs> what is acceptable in, in the church, in society, we have these affairs that are allowed. And you're like, oh, pastor, there is no acceptable affair. How many think like that? Nobody. I got two people that are one. I got two people to go. Yeah, we shouldn't have affairs. Mm. <laughs> Everybody else is like, oh, now you're meddling. <laughs> How many think that there are acceptable affairs? Raise your hand. OK, I got eight. All right. There you go. How many think all affairs are acceptable? Raise your hand. <laughs> I was just trying to see who I can get. <laughs> So as I was putting this together, because, uh, you know, every uh, October we do relationship series. And when we do the relationship series, I always try to bring a different perspective in uh, instead of doing the same stuff every year. And we can do, you know, uh, we can do marriage every year. Um, we can do like we can do all these things. And I thought, uh, man, uh, uh, what? So there's a book called Respectable Sins. Anybody ever read that book? Okay, I got one. The rest of you need to get it. At any rate, it's called Respectable Sins. And I'm reading it. And as I'm reading it, uh, I got the idea of acceptable affairs. And the church has acceptable affairs, and we shouldn't. And the world has acceptable affairs, and it shouldn't. And so what are acceptable affairs? And today we're going to talk about the, the biggest one, I think, that is, that is uh, uh, absolutely dominating our society and churches is anxiety. And you go, Pastor, that's not an affair. Let me help you. Yes, it is. And let me tell you why. If we look at the definition of affairs, we see there's two types of affairs that we can have. The first type that we can have is a physical affair, right? Where we cheat on our spouse, we, right? Amen. Somebody just let me know you're here. So, okay. Thank you. The second type of affair that we can have is emotional. Both are equally destructive in a marriage, in any relationship. And so I thought what I would hit is some acceptable affairs <clears throat> that many have and justify. Uh, as a matter of fact, anxiety is uh, consider, uh, considered a mental disorder. It's a disease. Well, you know why? So that they can put it under the health so everyone can get pills. So the prescription, uh, the medical places get lots of money. That's, or the pharmaceuticals get lots of money. So anytime we put it under a disease, now insurance can pay for it. And the reality is, guys, we, there, this is one affair that we can get rid of. This is an affair that we don't need. The emotional affair of anxiety is it separates you from God because you're not trusting God. It separates you from your spouse because now you're so focused on, on anxiety and on you that now your spouse is suffering. Your relationship begins to suffer. And so when people are like, Pastor, that's not an affair, Emotionally, it is. When it starts dominating your life in an unhealthy manner and separating you from your God and separating you from others, it's an affair by definition. And that's what we're going to talk about today, anxiety. And as each week goes on this month, we're going to, have, we're going to talk about a, a new affair. <laughs> And hopefully, hopefully I won't leave anybody out. <laughs> what I wanted to do today, though, was have Kevin and Louisa, if you'll come on up here. Uh, I asked uh, Louisa and Kevin if they would give their testimony on uh, acceptable affairs because uh, uh, they got the red one. Because uh, the truth is... <clears throat> 
Um, and L Louisa will share. Here, I'll just turn this down. You can have that with your notes. How's that? There you go. So the truth is, uh, and, and Louisa won't mind me saying this, and if she does, she has to forgive me. Um, the truth is, when it came to anxiety, Louisa was having an affair. And what I asked for today was for Louisa to share what that looked like in her life. And I asked Kevin to share the impact it had on him and the marriage. And so you're going to see both sides of the anxiety affair. Matter of fact, that's what I'm going to title this one, The Anxiety Affair. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Good morning. I hope everyone's having a good morning. Um, <clears throat> This is very intimidating to be up here, but I'm not alone because I have the Lord. I have Jesus. I love you too. <laughs> I have my husband up here that God has given me that's here to support me to get, get through this testimony. Um, when pastor had asked us to come up here and to share our testimony, my desire is that you guys don't see Kevin and Louisa, but you do see Jesus Christ in our life. You see his, his grace, his love, his mercy, his understanding, his discipline. And I'm very blessed that I'm at home because right now I'm at peace. I was quite nervous before getting up here, but I look out at my church family and I thank the Lord for you guys for your love that you've always been here for us and supported us. So we're gonna talk about anxiety. Um, I'm just gonna go back a little bit just to give you a foundation. Um, I was very blessed to be raised in a Christian home. I was, I accepted the Lord at eight years old, came to know Christ as my savior. I took that step of, um, of faith and I was a child of God. I Not long after that, I took the next step of obedience and was baptized. There are certain specific events in my life later on that I look back that cause my choices, not good ones, when having these anxieties. But I'm not going to talk about the events because that's not what is important. It's important to see how Christ saw me through this and, and showed me what the truth was. Um, when I was 30 years old, I ended up in the hospital, in the emergency room, I ended up later in the psychiatric unit. How did I end up there? A, a girl who was loved the Lord, who was saved, and I'll tell you what happened. It was a very slow progression of one day me focusing on the Lord, trusting in the Lord, and then slowly letting other people's sinful life, allowing, I was choosing to make those bad choices based on those events or uh, their sinful actions, like Pastor said last weekend. And it was a very slow progression that I started to take my eyes off for Jesus and stop reading the Word of God and stop growing. And when I, when we got married, I would say the first five years of our marriage was, was very difficult. And I take full responsibility for that because when you can't function the way that God created us to, that we're able to as a, as a wife and as a mother, because certain circumstances occur that I fall apart. So the focus is no longer on the Lord. The focus is now on me. How can God use me? And there was times when I, when Kevin and I got married, he was just two years uh, saved. And he himself needed to grow. But I wasn't helping him as, as a wife because of the choices that I was making that were ungodly, my actions. I mean, there was times where I would, I feel terrible even just saying that I said this, but I repented. I told my husband, I said, 
you need to get your act together and you need to start reading the word of God and be the man that God has called you to be in the house. How can I say that when myself, I wasn't being the example because first Peter, right? Two, we need to live our life. Three, thank you. As, as a witness for Christ. So moving forward, um, I was 2006. I was having these anxiety attacks. Um, we were visiting my parents and um, we were going to visit a, a family member. And I remember my husband telling me, I don't think this is a very good idea because he knew the circumstances around it and he knew how it was emotionally in these uh, anxiety. Um, but I ignored him. I didn't respect his decision for his family. That's disobedience to the Lord too, guys. I wasn't submitting to the Lord. Let alone, and I wasn't submitting to my husband. And so went there. Unfortunately, some things occurred. Once again, I put the focus on me. I had this horrible anxiety attack. My husband was smart enough to say, we need to leave. We need to go. We were on our way home. We were out of state, by the way. And I thought that I was having a heart attack. I thought this was it. I'm done. Um, let, just to give you a little history, I, I didn't want to live. I'll be honest with you. I knew sin was, I knew it is sinful to take your life, but I just said, Lord, I don't want to, I don't want to live anymore. I don't want to be a wife. I don't want to be a mother. And we were blessed with two beautiful boys. Uh, Kyle was just a little bit over a year. Matthew was just about four years old, but I ended up in the emergency room. Um, and after tests and everything, I, I, I wasn't having a heart attack. They, um, put me in the psychiatric unit and I wasn't talking to anyone. I was, I was hurt. I was angry. I was frustrated because I never dealt with a lot of things that just kept piling up, piling up, piling up. I wasn't seeking the Lord. I wasn't reading his word. I wasn't praying. I wasn't communicating to my, to my spouse the correct way. And, um, I remember being in, in the psychiatric unit. My dad was with me. My, my Kevin was there with me. The boys were outside with my mom. And I remember the doctor coming in and goes, there's nothing wrong with you. Nothing physically wrong with you. And he goes, I'll give you some medicine to calm down. And I remember Kevin leaving and my dad looked at me and he, and he said, what is going on? And I just looked at him and I just, my heart's broken. How do you explain your heart broken? And he looked at me and he goes, who do you have within, within you? And I said, Jesus. And he goes, your husband, your kids, your mom, your dad, we can't fix this, but Jesus Christ can. He's the one that's going to heal you. And that was in August of 2006. And that week I knew that I needed to get help, some Christian counsel. And I remember my sister telling me about a, a, a pastor and, and his wife that are, are prayer warriors. I'm just going to step back just a little bit. I forgot to share this part. Um, before I had this horrific disease attack, um, my husband got a phone call from my brother-in-law to move a new pastor and his wife and two kids to the area. And that week, if I'm not mistaken, we ended up meeting. I'm, I'm looking for the time frame. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Two weeks later, um, I was invited to my family's house. They invited. It's Pastor and Sherry I'm talking about, by the way, that I got to meet them. And um, I didn't really make the greatest uh, impression, you can say. Um, he might tell you differently, you know, because I wear my feelings on my shoulders. I, I really didn't want to meet a new pastor. I didn't want to do a deal with anyone. Um, but moving forward, after coming home from being in the hospital, um, I couldn't find anyone because we weren't attending a church. We weren't part of church. We didn't have a pastor. And I remember what my sister said. So I called up my sister really quick and I said, can I have John Westfall's, Westfall's phone number? Don't ask me any questions. Please just give it to me. So she gave it to me and I hung up. And I remember I was shaking. I had the phone. It was a Tuesday and it was raining outside. And Ka Matthew was in preschool. Kyle was taking a nap. And I remember calling and um, I didn't even know what I was going to say. And it was amazing how the Holy Spirit just gave me the words to call pastor. And um, because of their faithfulness to come here and be missionaries in this area, um, they, he listened to me and he said, okay, we're going to, we're going to meet that Thursday um, with Miss Sherry and pastor at their house. And the amazing thing is now, mind you, I've been raised in a Christian church. 
I was saved at eight years old. I went to church Sunday morning, Sunday evenings, Wednesday evenings. Pastor, Pastor John and Sherry did not even have a church yet. I came that Thursday to their home. They opened their arms to me. They didn't coddle me. They didn't, they didn't coddle me. I went, there's a difference. What they did for me is they opened up the word of God and shared the scriptures with me. And they did it out of God's love and showed me my, God revealed to me my faults, my selfishness, my actions was not in any way glorifying the Lord. It is truthful to have hurt, to have pain, to be hurt because other people's actions, it's going to happen. But is what we do afterwards is where it's godly or ungodly. And I remember there's two verses that Pastor and Sherry shared with me. And I, Philippians 4, 6 through 7, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts, minds through Christ Jesus. I can't tell you what that night meant to me because that's my beginning of my healing process. And I thank the Lord that he gave me a husband that was with me every step of the way, the good, the bad, the ugly, and that we were part of a church and that in that church we grew in the word of God. We saw it, we found the truth, we fellowship, we lift each other up. It's very important, it's very, excuse me, very important to be part of a church. And it's something that we deal with every day. Some, it, God healed me of anxiety. That was the last time that I had that any type of an anxiety attack. And I praise Jesus for that. And I see through the 17 years, him just continually growing us and continually learning. And sometimes we do fall short of the Lord. And even in 2020, 2021 was really not a good year for me, those two years. But God also revealed certain things to me that I needed to work on and grow in. And once again, I had the opportunity to meet with Pastor Sherry. And I remember when I first saw them, when we met, the Holy Spirit just jumped within me because I knew that I was going to be given the truth, the word. And I thank God for him just putting people in my life, my husband and Pastor Sherry, my church to continue to help me uh, grow in this area. And that God has just uh, healed me from this. And, but our, we have to remember we are responsible for our actions because what it did, it did separate me. It was in an affair. It was an emotional affair because I wasn't focusing on the Lord. I wasn't growing. I was letting other people make decisions for me instead of me being the husband and wife, the unit together, focusing on that. And um, I just th thank you guys for listening to, to my testimony. And I, I just, I do thank the Lord for, for his mercy, grace and his love and, the, and his, and sometimes he needs to kick us <laughs> and that's, and, and that's okay. You know, so. That, so on the husband side of things, I, see, I feel stressed differently than what the average person feels. I don't allow myself to get stressed out. And while watching Louisa go through this, there was never a time in, my, in our marriage that I thought where I was going to leave her, where I told her to suck it up and get over it. I knew something was wrong with her. I just couldn't fix it. Where I failed, and she mentioned this earlier, when we argue and she say, I need to read my Bible, she was correct. Because as the man of the home, whether I was two years a Christian or 40 years a Christian, I'm responsible for her spiritual being in my home. And I failed her. We weren't in church. I was not walking with God. I praise Jesus that God showed her through pastor, through Sherry. And she's been healed of it now. I have a tendency to find blessings and negatives. The blessing that I found in this with her going through her anxiety 
and everything that she went through, especially that summer of 2006. I saw victory in Christ that went beyond. And this is the first time I can say this. I got saved in 1998. And this was in the summer of 2006, in the fall of 2006. This is the first time that I realized that victory in Christ goes beyond your salvation. It's about obedience. It's about fellowship with him. And as a husband, it's about being her spiritual leader in the home. She motivated me for that. She was right for six years. <laughs> no denying it. I was not who I was supposed to be. Victory in Christ is when she overcame that. And I praise God for that victory. It goes beyond that salvation. It's when you can conquer something like that. Thank you. So one of the things that I wanted you to see through that testimony was she had anxiety, severe anxiety, to the point where it put her in the hospital, thought she was having a heart attack. Um, uh, Kevin, even though he was not going to leave her, was uh, when he and I talked, he goes, I can't take it anymore. He goes, I just can't take it. And so what we see is the uh, uh, anxiety affair is no different than a physical affair as far as the outcome. Amen. When Louisa got under the word of God and started growing and learning, she realized, wow, this is about me. Which was interesting that she, one of the things she didn't share was when she came and sat down and we started talking, we were about 30 minutes in. And I said, listen, Louisa, I can help you out. And mind you, we just, this is only the second time we ever met. And I don't know that she really liked me the first time we met. Um, and, uh, and so we sat down and we were about 30 minutes in on the conversation. And I said, Louisa, I can help you. Right up front, I'll tell you right up front, we won't meet any more than eight times. Because eight times in, in the eight meetings, I'll give you all the tools you'll ever need to be successful in life uh, through scripture. So we'll meet eight times. We'll have eight, eight meetings. No more than that. Otherwise, you're wasting my time. I'm wasting your time because... Uh, you can do this. And I said, and I know what the problem is. And she said, like, like a kid in a candy store, what is it? <laughs> and I said, you're selfish. And she goes, you want to explain that? <laughs> hey, pretty accurate, Louisa. Really? Yeah. And, uh, and I was like, yeah, you, you've made, this is all about you. This is all about you. And one of the things about anxiety and the reason that it starts to dominate us, and I, and I love that she put this in her testimony because when I asked her to give testimony, I had no clue what she was going to say, although I did tell her to keep it inside of about four minutes, and that, that didn't happen. But that's okay, amen? Uh, I appreciated every word. And one of the things that she said was, I was allowing other people's lives to dictate mine. And then I didn't like, I didn't like what was going on. So I'll give you an, a for example. If her family started arguing and fighting amongst one another, she couldn't stop that. She couldn't control that. But how could she control it? Have an anxiety attack and all of a sudden everything stops and it focuses on her. <clears throat> See, anxiety is not a, a, a mental disorder. Anxiety is an issue of pride. And you're like, whoa, pastor, now you're crossing the line. No, 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 you need to hear me. <clears throat> it's an issue of pride. Because anxiety means we're not getting what we want. Things aren't going the way we think they should go, and we don't know how to deal with it. And so then we allow anxiousness to come in to create what we think is going to be an altering situation. And it is, but it's always negative. And so then I know we have people, and, there, and listen, there may be a multitude of you in here that uh, are taking anxiety medication. <clears throat> and I think the reason you're taking anxiety medication, and listen, I'm not yaying or naying either side. I have my opinion, but it's like armpits. Everybody's got one. They usually always stink. So I'll leave it alone, right? <clears throat> 
my opinion on anxiety medicine is number one, it's a mind altering drug. How do I know this? Because you're taking it to control your thoughts. Right? To bring, to bring down. Matter of fact, I was talking to, to someone uh, a couple of weeks ago that they got they were being having anxiety and depression. And so they went and they put it, they put them on the on the med, meds. And and she told me this. She said, Pastor, uh, it was interesting because I went from being crazy about everything to having no feelings at all. Like you could have told me my dog died, and I'd have been like, oh, okay. It just shut my emotions off. So it's mind altering. And if it, if it shuts you off, what is it doing? It's separating you from God. It's separating you from other relationships because now you're not you. And that's another thing that affairs do. Affairs cause people to not be themselves. And so now you become a whole new person. And to you, it becomes better because everything's suppressed. But to the people around you, it's divisive because it's like, wow, who's that person? And so what I want to do as we go through this, and guys, I'm telling you, I'm, gonna, I'm hitting the real things in Scripture on, on uh, affairs. Uh, one, of the, one of the affairs that I'm going to be talking about is, and, and I'm not going to give you all of them, but I'll give you this one. <clears throat> An acceptable affair that you have is with yourself. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we get caught up in us, don't we? Dang gum, I'm handsome. <laughs> or we lose our identity. I am who I am. Well, the Bible says, oh, blah, 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 right? And now, on the outside, we're all pious. And we agree with the Scriptures, but on the inside, we battle God. We do the same thing when it comes to anxiety. And some of you are going to sit here, and the whole time, if you're on medication, you're going to justify that medication rather than listen to your real answer that will deliver you from everything. And so my goal today is to help you throw the medication. I'm not, I am not a medication fan. I will tell you that right now. I don't, listen, I, 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 I mm, nope, don't want any of it. None of it. I'm on medication now. So I can get up here and preach. And uh, no, I'm kidding. I am on medication now, but why? Because I had a bacteria in my stomach. So they're like, you got to take this and you got to take that. And, 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 and it was like, oh, okay. But they don't tell me the side effects. Side effects, severe stomach cramping, and run to the bathroom as fast as you can, and it gets to be a game where can I make it? <laughs> I hate medication. Why? Because it, it alters. Now, not all medication is bad. Don't, some, some people, listen, it helps, and, and it's regulated you. and fantastic. But that's for a physical ailment. If you're taking medication for anxiety, that is a mental break. And your identity with God. Because that's where it starts. I have some stats that I want to show. And, and, and man, I, I want to rush through this, but it might be a part two. And I'll add and something else in it next week. Uh, I don't know if you can read this. It's the best I could do as far as uh, uh, big wise uh, so everyone can see it. But this is before COVID-19. This, this right here, the survey was taken in 2021, about 2020. And 19% uh, of all adults experience a mental illness. 1.5 million people over the last years. 1.5 million people over, over the last year's data for mental illness. So from 2020 to 2021, 1.5 million more people with mental issues. On the top right, suicidal ideation among adults is increasing 0.15% or over 460,000 people from the previous year want to commit suicide. That's not a health issue. That's a mental issue. And you know why? Because where's the hope? Uh, where's the, oh, okay, I can't get there. I'll, we'll be here till three. 24% of adults with a mental illness report an unmet need for treatment. 
And I, I think you could just leave the for treatment off because the reality is when we start having this anxiety and all this mental, uh, and by the way, this is all under anxiety uh, for the uhnational.org uh, mental place that this is what they do. And, and, and but uh, it goes on in the 24%, this number has not declined since 2011. It grows every year. It's not declining. And if you look at our society, it's even more whacked out, amen? Or disturbed. How, how do you explain mental disorders? I don't know. At any rate, 9.7% of youth in the U.S. have severe major depression. The rate was, the, uh, was highest among youth who identify as more than one race. Because what's our, what's our and that's just in, uh, in 2021. What was the issue? Our politics, right? Made race an issue. And it's not. It shouldn't be. But they made race an issue. And so uh, now it is causing those that, that are different than whites to have severe depression and anxiety. Highest among youth who identify as more than one race is 12.4%, which is significant higher than just a regular teen, if you will. 60% of youth with depression do not receive any mental health treatment. Uh, even in the states with the greatest access, uh, one in three are going without treatment. Even among the 20, uh, only 27%, even among youth with severe depression who receive some treatment, receive uh, consistent care, only 27%. So the rest are just going without. And then uh, what's our highest ones committing suicide? Youth. 10.8% of Americans with a mental illness are uh, uninsured uh, and then so now uh, insurance isn't covering it for 10%, and then there's other issues, and so the number just keeps rising. And nobody's getting fixed. And then when we do get fixed, the answer is, is what? A pill. It's a pill. Because we're a microwave society, we want it fixed instantly. And sometimes you just got to work through the junk to get on the other side. And it's not a pill. It's just working through what's going on that's, that's separating us from God or separating us from our spouse or from our family. Next slide, please. This is a little bit harder to see, so I'll have to point it out to you. Um, this is adults with serious thoughts of suicide. The percentage of adults reporting serious thoughts of suicide is 4.3 for 4.3 uh, percent. Uh, Estimated number of adults with serious suicidal thoughts is over 10.7 million. This is in America alone. It's uh, uh, over 10.7 million, an increase of over 460,000 people from last year's data. Thoughts of suicide is uh, uh, 460,000 more people over last year want to commit suicide, and we're already at 10.7 million in our society. And we might go, well, that compared to, to, compared to our 360 million, that's not that bad. Are you kidding me? One is too bad. And then if you look at uh, the rankings, you guys can see the colors up here, right? The darkest colors are the least affected for wanting to commit suicide. The lightest colors are the most uh, of those that want to commit suicide, where they're living wise. Next one, please. Next slide. <clears throat> Youth with at least one major depressive episode in the past year. 13.84% um, of youth ages 12 to 17 report suffering from at least one major depressive episode over a year, right? Childhood depression is more likely to persist into an adulthood if gone untreated, but only half the children get treatment. The number of youth experiencing this, this depression uh, increased by 206,000 from the year before. 206,000 more kids. And remember, this is only what's reported. And, uh, and, and less than a third is getting reported. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, youth with severe major depressive episodes. 9.7% uh, of youth, uh, which is over 2.3 million, uh, cope with severe major depression. The number of youth experienced severe uh, increased by 126,000 over last year. Next one. Uh, so here we have, we have COVID and mental health 2020 data uh, uh, numbers. 
and the number of people looking for help with anxiety and depression has skyrocketed from September 20th. Uh, 315,220 people took anxiety screen of 93% increase over 2019. 93% increase. Severe anxiety and depression. The number of people screening with moderate to severe symptoms of depression and anxiety continue to increase, th increase throughout 2020 and remains higher than the rates prior to COVID-19. Which means what? Man, when society gets dominated, if we're not anchored into Christ, we get dominated. Anxiety and depression kick in. Uh, more people are reporting frequent thoughts of suicide and self-harm than ever been recorded. Uh, since 2014, which is when they started keeping track of this, by the way, it was 2014. Since the COVID-19 pan pandemic began to spread rapidly in 2020, uh, over 178,000 people have reported frequent suicidal ideation. 37% of people reported having thoughts of suicide more than half or ne nearly every day. Every day, that's what they focus on, committing suicide. And it, the numbers go on. They just go on. Give me the next slide, please. All right, so this right here, mounting anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation. These are the numbers. January uh, uh, through September of 2020. January, 71%. Uh, if you look in July, August, September, 79, 79, 80%. Throughout the year, it just kept climbing and climbing and climbing. Guys, I'm telling you, our society is in desperate need of Jesus. Next slide, please. If you look here, uh, over eight in 10 youth screening uh, moderate to severe anxiety since March of 2020. If you look in January, 80%, uh, and then it just climbed. You get to August, September, you're up to almost 85%. And then over nine in 10 youth uh, uh, screening moderate to severe depression in March of 2020, uh, there was an increase of uh, 38,215. These are just real numbers that I'm giving you of people that want to, you can get rid of these slides, that want to commit suicide, that want to end it, that are severe depressed or massive anxiety. And mom, dad, if you are full of anxiety, you will pass pass that down to your children, not genetically, but listen, if I walk into the room and I'm happy, go lucky, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be like, Hey, yeah. Right. But if I walk in a room, I'm like, what is your problem? Just why are you even talking to me? Have you ever been in a, have you ever been in a room and someone walk in it and it changed the whole room? Yeah, this is what we're talking about. So parents, if you are full of anxiety, you, here's what you're doing. You walk into your house, it changes everything. Kids run to their rooms. The other spouse has to go to the store, go to the garage. It changes everything. Don't think that you're keeping it secret. Oh, and then if we're going to take the medicine, by the way, I haven't even got into scriptures yet. Ugh. If you think taking the medicine is helping you, you go from being extreme emotional and destructive, then you get on the medicine and now you don't care because it shut you off. Both are equally acidic and disastrous. And so what's the answer? Man, you guys asked the best questions. All right, we're going to get to it. We're going to get there. And, 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 and you know what? If I got to do a part two next week on anxiety, I'll attach fear and worry with it because anxiety, fear and worry. Uh, by the way, uh, fear and worry feed anxiety. So they really just are all encompassing. They're all encompassing. And by the way, how many live in a, a today? You're fearful of what's happening tomorrow or what's coming tomorrow. Let's just be honest. Amen. Listen, the unknown, there is nothing worse than the unknown. Unless you're just an adventurist at heart, and then you're like, let's ride the pony. See where it takes us, right? And so uh, if I have to do part two next week, I'll do part two, and I'll attach fear, worry, and all that into it, and I'll just kind of rewrite it, and it'll be, it'll be really, really good. So acceptable affairs, the number one is anxiety that we're talking about. Uh, look here in First Peter 5, 6 through 7, and also change the back screen because I forgot to change it from last week. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. 
You notice the first thing he says here is what? Humble yourself. Look here. Casting all your care, and that word care literally in the Greek is anxiety. Cast all your anxiety upon him, for he cares for you. Go back to the first verse, please. Humble yourselves. If you humble yourselves, he takes care of all your anxiety. See, guys, when I said earlier, when I told Louisa, pride is the issue, Pride is the issue and the, the core, if you will, and you don't even have to agree with this, but if you search out the scriptures and what I'm going to show you today, you're going to see that it's absolutely true that pride is the center focus of feeding anxiety and fear and worry and depression and all that that goes with it. Because at the core, we've made it about me. At the core, it's about you. And if we can't die to ourselves, we will feed all these negatives. And let me tell you something. You guys have heard, I've said it before. Uh, if you've not heard this, I always ask, uh, which dog is stronger, the black dog or the white dog? And everybody goes, well, the black dog Satan and the white dog is God, so it would have to be the white dog. <laughs> white dog or black dog let me tell you the one that's strongest and will always be the strongest the one that you feed the most it's the one that you feed the most that will always be the strongest and if you have anxiety fear worry depression and you feed those emotional feelings by the way god says that he's given us our emotions to be uh, our, our servant not our master and when we surrender to the anxiety and the fear and the worry and all that that comes with it we've allowed our emotions to be our master and god says you got it backwards and what will happen if it's our master we feed our master we take care of that which is the most important to us amen and, and you go well anxiety is not that important i want to get rid of it but i can't get rid of it it's because that's what you're feeding If we're going to deal with this, we got to deal with it and then realize that we have to humble ourselves. I ain't even going to get to my notes because I don't have time, but that's okay. Humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Next verse. Casting all of your anxiety upon him. If you notice the first thing that he does, he's like, if you want success, you humble yourselves before me, God says. And then you take all that anxiety and you cast it on me because I'll take it. I'll take it. Because if you know Scripture at all, it says, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. God says, I've not given you a spirit of fear, but a boldness and a sound mind. What are you fearful of? God tells us in Matthew, why are you worrying? You can't change the color of your hair whether it be white or black, right? I just wish I had hair. Now, today you can change it with dye, but the reality is you can't change what's really there. It is what it is, amen? And he's like, why are you worrying? Why are you, why are you so filled of, uh, uh, with anxiety? And, and the reason is, is because we're so focused on how am I going to handle deal with or survive whatever may or may not come. Do you realize that 95% of what you worry about never comes to fruition anyway? You remember last week when I shared my testimony with you of anxiety, when, when I heard uh, what, a voice in my head, and I'm telling you, if you've ever, if you've ever experienced this, it is the most insane thing. And, and, and so uh, I'm talking and all of a sudden uh, the response in my head was so audible, you won't be here. Talking about I won't be here this, this winter. And so I took it upon that, oh my goodness, man, I'm, oh, I'm going to die. I got to get everything in order. And I'm not, even, I'm not even a guy that gets filled with anxiety. I, anxiety, fear, worry, psh, I don't have time for that junk. Jesus, take the wheel. I got to go, right? I mean, that's how I live. And then all of a sudden, this just captivated me. And when it captivated me, guess what it did? It separated me from you, from my wife. And from God, because every day I was consumed with the thought of, I'm going to die this winter and I got to get everything put together. And then I remembered the scriptures. God is not a God of chaos. This is making me chaotic. 
Why are you anxious? Humble yourself. Don't make it about you. Humble yourself and give it to me. Why are you fearful? I'm not giving you the spirit of fear, but a boldness and a sound mind. And as I remembered the scriptures, all of a sudden I went, Lord, it's yours. And I never took it back. Louisa, when you said, Lord, it's yours, you never took it back. You, know, you haven't had an anxiety attack since we met in 2006, September of 2006. No medication, no nothing. And you might go, well, that's her. That's not me. Mine's worse. No, your attitude is worse. Your attitude on how to handle it is worse. And your desire to surrender it all to God isn't there yet. And it's not until we get to the point where we're like, Lord, uh, this is destroying my life. It is an affair that I'm having on you. It is an affair that I'm having on my spouse. It is an affair I'm having on my children. And so, Lord, I'm, I'm giving it all to you. And when we reach that point and we surrender it, we cast it all upon him. He cares for us. He'll take it. The first thing to stop the affair of anxiety is humility. Humble yourself. And you might think that I'm, in, I'm insane, but that means you don't believe the Scripture. Because that's the first thing that He tells us to do with anxiety. Casting all your anxiety, that's literally in the Greek, it's anxiety. Humble yourself. Then you can get rid of it, because you're not making it about you, you're making it about God. And when we make it about God, it fixes every aspect of our life. Everything. And you're like, Pastor, how do I do that? That's all in my notes. <laughs> I knew when I jumped into this that time was not going to be my friend. And, and listen, these pastors that do 20-minute sermons, I mean, God bless them. But I have no, I can't, look, I can't even get my intro in in 20 minutes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but I am not going to keep you past two o'clock. All right, here we go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I will keep you until 3.30 when the Bills game is over. <laughs> so here's the funny. When Carl said Bills play at one, Tom went, yeah. <laughs> they both need Jesus. That's all I'm saying. All right. So in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Let me, let me just pull you uh, in on this real quick. So this is Jesus talking, and, and he is, uh, uh, because they're getting all worried and stressed about stuff. And look what he says here, and j just keep scrolling when we go, okay? Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. Don't worry about your life. Lord, what do you mean don't worry about my life? It's my life. What do you want me? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, is not life more than food and body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. And by the way, do you guys realize that uh, a bird does not store up food at all? Birds do not store food. They eat what they need every day. Now, here's what's more interesting than that, because when we look at uh, uh, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Here's the interesting thing about a bird, just to give you an idea of how God takes care of them. When people go, oh, I eat like a bird. Be careful because a bird eats equal to its own weight every day. <laughs> just a little fun fact to give you. And my point is, is that if God is going to feed a bird every day equal to his own weight, and they don't store up. They don't put away for winter. How much more is what the Bible says, uh, uh, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valued than they? That's one of the issues that causes anxiety because we don't realize our value in God and how much God values us. We actually lose our identity. When we get anxiety, we, lo we, we lose our identity. If we're a child of God, why do you live like a pauper? Why, why do you, why are you like the, the, the homeless man 
uh, down under the bridge that has urinated all over himself and stinks? Why are you like that person when you are a child, if you are a child of God, that you are a child of the King? And we live in defeat. Uh, next. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. No, you went too far. Back up. So why do you worry about... Yeah, so which of you worry can add one cubit to a stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet, I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these, giving you the idea that this king who had all the money, who was incredibly wealthy, didn't even look as beautiful as the lilies of the field. And he goes on, Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, uh, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? See, that's the issue. If anxiety is taking over your life, there's two problems. Pride, and you don't have faith in God. And you're like, you're telling me I don't trust God? Yes. Yeah. Uh, according to Scripture. Not, that's not my opinion. It's according to Scripture, because even Jesus asked, why are you worrying about all this and stressing out and having anxiety all this? Is the, will God not take care of you better than the birds of the field and clothe you better than the lilies of the field? And, and take what, what, what is your problem? Faith, right? Oh, you have little faith. God can't take care of me. I got to take care of myself. God can't take care of my family. I got to take care of my family. God, you, I, I got to do it. And then we go crazy. And God's like, why are you doing that? It's because you don't trust me enough. Remember Peter walked on water? And he walked. The Bible says that he walked. It wasn't like he stepped out and went down. The Bible said he walked. Whether it was two steps, three steps, 25 steps, doesn't matter. He walked. And the minute he took his eyes off of Jesus, he sank. And then Jesus reaches down. By the way, Peter said, Lord, save me. Bam. He reaches down, pulls him up, and then looks at him and says, why did you doubt? And you know why he doubted? You know why he had a little faith? Because he looked around at the storm that was going around him and forgot about the Savior that sustained him. And he made it about him. And he became filled with fear and worry and anxiety, and he sank. Guys, I'm telling you, we're no different. We're no different. You take your eyes off Jesus, you will sink. Oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek for your heavenly father knows what you need, that you need all these things. But seek first. See, there's our answer again. Right there, there's our answer. All this worry, stress, anxiety, and, 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 and how it dominates our life. And here's the answer. But seek first. And the problem with, with people and society is we seek God somewhere in the top ten. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what will happen? Everything will be added unto you. Why are you worrying about it? And the problem is we leave God out and stress how we are going to do it. And God says, if you bring me in and you die to yourself, I'll supply all your need. And we got it reversed. Society's reversed. And look at it crashing and burning. The churches are starting to reverse. Bringing the world in, acting like the world, doing the things of the world to, 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 to what? To keep them lost? They're reversing and wondering why churches across America and around the world are bleeding out. And it's because we fail to do this. Man, I didn't even, that was, I ain't even done, that's not even my intro. <sighs> Let me say this. If you fail 
to put God first. Do not be shocked if your life is in disarray. Don't be stunned. Because you got exactly what God said would happen if you don't put Him first. And you're like, how do I do that? Man, that's in my notes. <laughs> I tell you what. You come back next week. <clears throat> and I'll share with you my notes on how to handle it. But understand this. I'll just quickly tell you, if you don't go to the Lord in prayer, and if you don't, the Bible tells us uh, to take captive um, every word or every thought that is ungodly. And so the beginning of how to deal with anxiety is you, you, when that, and those emotions is when it starts coming into your life or starts dominating, uh, of coming out of you, you take it captive. It's sinful. Take any sin. You take it captive, meaning that you do not allow it to master you. You, you take control of that. And then you humble yourself, Lord, I can't, I can't do this on my own. And then you give it to God. And he says he'll take it. And many of you are like, I've tried that. The problem is you don't leave it there. If it's still consuming your life, it's because you took it with you when you said, God. Lord, I'm leaving it all at the foot of the cross. Father, I'm going to just set it right here because it's killing me. It's dominating me. And I'm giving it to you. All right, it's done. And it's just a pile of dung that we carry around. Now you know what the base of that looks like. All right, so. Funny, it looks bad, don't it? And where do we put all of our sin? At the base of the cross. Amen. There you go. Justified that ugly. <laughs> Let me tell you something. The first step is giving it to God. The second step is leaving it with God. Third step is captivate all your thoughts and emotions. You grab them and you control them. They don't control you. And then the fourth step, humble yourself and walk in the glory of God. Those are your steps. I got verses next week to back up the steps. But if you don't start by going to God in prayer and just giving it to him, I guess the first step is acknowledging that you're the issue. And it's not the people around you. Right? Listen, if I allow the people around me to dictate my life, I'd be a statistic on wanting to commit suicide. But I don't, because God's my God. People are not. My wife is my wife. My children are my children. I am strengthened through Christ and through the God's Word. And so therefore, He tells us with all of that, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. 1 Corinthians 50, pull that thing up, and then I'm finishing. Because I said I wasn't going to go long and dig on it. I'm, I'm working on it. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. By the way, this is, this is my... This is my life verse, if you will. And it's talking about if you were to back up in the, starting in, in uh, uh, verse 50. It, it starts talking about, oh, death, where is your sting? Right? Like death can't take us out. We have victory over death. We got victory over anxiety. We got victory over, over everything. And so here it says, therefore, my beloved brethren, that's the Christian only, lost man can't have this. Be steadfast, anchor yourself in, immovable. I will not be moved. I will be steadfast on the task, and that is to humble myself and to love the Lord thy God with all my heart, mind, and soul. Always abounding, what? In the things of God. In the things of God. Not, not man, not ourselves, but in the things of God. Knowing, this is that that reassurance guaranteed it's a promise knowing 
that your labor is not in vain in Lord, in the Lord, and that whatever you do in the name of Jesus is not in vain. There's your, there's your, that's the secret to your success. And the problem is we allow the world to move us. Golly, man. The Bible says don't go left or right. And we're like, whoa. We're tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. About, okay, that's my soapbox, man. That's next week. Golly, guys. Grab this. I need you to grab this. I need you to grab this. If you're going to have success in your life, you've got to grab this. If you're going to put Satan out, you've got to grab this. If you're going to put God first, you've got to grab this. And if you're going to get healthy, you've got to grab this. Throw your excuses away. Stop justifying your sin. Stop telling me I don't understand and stop telling everybody else you need the medicine and that, that you can't control it. And it's a disease. It's not. It's a mental issue because you have a heart issue. All right. Be steadfast and immovable, always pursuing God, and I promise you He'll deliver you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I know I didn't even follow not any of my notes. But Father, I felt like I delivered the message that you wanted delivered. And so, Father, right now, I just pray your hand upon each and every one here. And Lord, I pray, especially for those who are dealing with depression or anxiety or worry or fear or whatever it is that's going on in their life. Father, that is not of you. You give us a peace that passes all understanding. You give us strength and you deliver us. And so, Father, right now, I'm just praying, 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 Father, that for every person sitting here that is dealing with anxiety, that, that Lord, that you just remind them of the Scriptures and remind them step one, step one, humble yourself. Father, we need to humble ourselves before you. You're the great and mighty God, not us. And so, Father, I pray that we have victory through you. I pray each and every person here, Father, that they, they look at where they're at and they're honest with themselves and then they make the right steps to get rid of or to do whatever needs to be done to put you first. And Father, for those of us who may not have anxiety and fear and worry and all that that dominates our life, Father, help us to help everyone that does to make the difference, Father. To not run from them or hide from them because that's the first thing we want to do sometimes if it just gets overwhelming and then it's too much for us to deal with as well. Father, give us the strength to hang in there in the fight with each and every one so we can help them have victory. Lord, we need you. Father, we need you. We need your hand. We need your strength. And so I ask that you give that to us today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you cannot draw from his power. You, the, 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 the words of God that say uh, child and brethren, and, and they're all referencing Christian. And, and if you don't have Jesus, you are left in the balance of living a defeated life. And you need, to, you need to turn everything over to God. And the first step to turning it over to the Lord is you have to surrender and make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. And you say, how do I do that? The Bible says that you got to believe that He's the only way to heaven, that He died on the cross for your sins, that He conquered death and hell, and He's at the right hand of the Father. And the Bible says if you believe that, and you put your faith in Jesus, you're saved. And so if that's your desire, I want you to pray this prayer with me. The words aren't magical. The words don't save you. It's, do you have the heart attitude that you really want this to do, that you want to do this and that it's real? And if it's real and you're really giving your life to Christ, that's what makes you saved, not the prayer. Please don't be deceived. If it's your desire, you pray this prayer. If you've already asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, you don't have to do it over and over. The Bible says you get saved. It's eternal life. It's a one-time gift forever and ever and ever, never to end. And so if it's your desire, you pray this prayer quietly to yourself. Father in heaven, today I surrender. Today, I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. Today, I believe that he conquered the grave. Today, I believe he's at the right hand of you. And today, I believe he is the only way to heaven. 
And so today I surrender all to you, Father. I ask that you forgive me of all my sins. Wash me white as snow. Father, today I repent. I will no longer follow the way of the world, but I will turn from my wicked ways and I will follow Jesus. Today my life is no longer mine, but I give it to you. We at Connecting Point Church are excited to have you join us. When you come, you'll experience a friendly, lively, and casual family-like atmosphere that welcomes you as you are. Our messages combine straightforward biblical truths, humor, and life-changing challenges for you to learn and grow in God's Word. We believe in connecting people to Christ, to the plans and gifts He has for them, and with people in our community who share these values. We also believe in reaching out to our local area and the regions beyond. We're dedicated to being a place where your entire family can believe, belong, and become all that God intends you to be. Discover the abundance of life in Jesus Christ as you begin to understand the roots of the problems and learn to apply the tools for you to triumph over your challenges today. It'll be a breath of fresh air in this unsettled world.